This is Research Like a Pro, episode 262, Michelle Dickens' Certification Journey. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go! Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com. Break down genealogy brick walls with a subscription to the largest online newspaper archive. Hi everyone, welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi Nicole, how are you today? Doing well. How are you? What's been going on? Well, I've been reviewing a bunch of client reports that our researchers have turned in, and one today was so interesting. This client is doing a trip to Prague in the Czech Republic this summer, and knew she had ancestors there and wanted to find some ancestral locations. And so we were able to further her ancestry and get a lot of locations for her in It involved different languages, different actual country names, you know, because the borders change so often there, and this was in the 1800s. And so it was really fun to learn a little bit more about researching in that area of the world, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, you know, so many different names for that specific area. So that was fun. Were a lot of the records online? Yes, so my researcher didn't have to work with anybody on site because often we do that if they are not online, but they are really working to get a lot of these records online now. And we were able to literally pinpoint specific houses that are still standing that the client can go visit and churches. And so that's going to be really neat. Yay, how wonderful. Well, for our announcements today, we have our Airtable Quick Reference Guide available on the website, familylocket.com. And for our Research Like a Pro webinar series for 2023, the next webinar will be on July 22nd, and this will be done by Alice Childs, who's an accredited genealogist. She's one of our researchers, and the title is, Who Were the Parents of David R. Matheson? A DNA Case Study. So this is a fascinating study. This was another one of our clients and it takes place in Nova Scotia. And as is typical with the era, the ancestor didn't leave any clues about who were his parents, just this clue of Nova Scotia. And so Alice used DNA as well as the documents to eliminate all candidates but one. And so that's gonna be a fun webinar. Our next Research Like a Pro study group begins August 30th and meets weekly for 11 weeks. Registration does end on August 10th, so if you've been thinking about it, please sign up. And our peer group leader application is on our website if you'd like to help lead a small group and provide feedback to them and you receive complimentary registration. And then join our newsletter for our coupons. Today, we're excited to have a guest, Michelle Dickens. She's a member of our Research Like a Pro Facebook group and recently announced in our group that she had received her certification credential from the Board for Certification of Genealogists. So I was excited to see that because as many of you know, I'm working on my own portfolio for certification. And so Michelle's here to tell us about her certification journey. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so uh, back in about 1998, I was really into scrapbooking, and I decided to transfer my grandmother's old pictures out of the magnetic album, the bad ones, into a scrapbook for a Christmas gift. And what I figured out really quickly is that I might know some of the people who were in the pictures, but I didn't have enough information to even complete the scrapbook. So that started my obsession with family history and trying to figure out who all these people were. So I had a cousin who'd done a little basic research, but nothing with any sources on it, Um, much of our family had been undocumented until I started. So I'm continuing to research and I ventured into DNA as well. Um, I do this as a hobby. I'm not a, a genealogical professional in my real life. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work as a field scientific expert for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I live in Missouri in the same town I grew up in, and uh, between my husband and I, we have four adult children, and I have one grandchild, and none of them have the slightest interest in genealogy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Well, that's wonderful that you were able to get started by working on 
the album and transferring it to a scrapbook. And hopefully those things that you're creating and leaving behind, they will come to appreciate over time. I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) That's so neat that you're in real life, a nurse practitioner, but that you took the time to create your genealogy skills to the level of a credentialed genealogist. So that's so neat that you decided to do that. So how did you decide to go for certification and submit a portfolio? I had heard about certification uh, through the Legacy Family Tree webinars and also on your podcast from your journey. I hold several certifications in my job in the medical field, so certification has always made sense to me to validate your skill set. Um, so I've, I've been researching now for over 25 years and trying to grow my skills. So once I started learning more about the process of certification, I thought I had a pretty good chance of being successful. That's interesting that you say once you started learning about it, you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. I remember the feeling that I had when I felt like I was ready to go for certification. And before that, when I had first started researching and like thinking about doing research at a more advanced level, I looked at the requirements and they didn't even make sense to me. (laughs) And I was like, maybe someday, but I don't think I'm ready yet. And then years later, I realized, okay, I think I can do that now. So it's interesting how that realization comes on. Well, I love that you had several certifications in your medical field. And I wonder, you know, that maybe took some of the scariness out of it because you were used to doing something like this. I I would imagine that would have helped a bit. Maybe a little bit, but this was really scary for me for some reason <laughs> because I, I wasn't sure if I was ready. You know, like I, you don't know till you try, right? I mean, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. at some point you have to just do it and and let the chips fall where they may. So I just went for it. I love that. Well, as an accredited genealogist, I'm just always so curious about why people choose one over the other. So did you consider accreditation as well? And if yes, how did you choose between the two? I did look into both routes, and I appreciated your talking about on the podcast your journey with accreditation, but I felt like accreditation was probably more appropriate for someone who wanted to be a a genealogy professional, who wanted to do research work for a client to really prove that you have in-depth knowledge of a particular region. Since I'm just researching for myself, I felt like the BCG certification just fit more with my goals. I wanted to validate and push my research skills and my writing skills for my own research. And my family is not, they're in a lot in the South, but not in one particular area. So I decided to be more of a broad certification than an in-depth in one area. I think it's really interesting thinking about that choice between accreditation and certification, and it makes perfect sense that you just wanted to do this for yourself. You weren't going to do client work, and that really is a thing that accreditation is such a good preparation for client work. So I think that's a great path for you. You know, that's interesting about not having a specific region that fit exactly with what you wanted to do. That's kind of how I felt as well. I had originally started on accreditation and then the region split. And so half of the states I had experience in were one in one region and the other half were in another. And at that point I considered maybe I should do certification. And so I think that is a really valid thing to think about when you're considering both is, you know, do you have experience all in one place or do you have different states or different countries and regions that aren't necessarily all grouped together? All right. Well, Michelle, tell us what educational opportunities did you take advantage of to prepare for submitting your portfolio? I actually gave a lot of credit to your books and podcasts when I had to describe my learning opportunities for the portfolio. So there you go. <laughs> you guys are you guys were critical in my in my certification. I've always been really process and organization driven, so I like to look at a particular process and see how I can improve upon it. So looking at new research methods is always fun for me and I think that's one reason I'm really drawn to your podcast is because you're tr- you're teaching strategies that you can apply to lots of different situations. Um, I also love the Legacy Family Tree webinars and YouTube videos, so I like listening to someone talk. I love a 
Elizabeth Schoen Mills um, on the Legacy Family Tree. She is so wonderful about giving you techniques that you can apply to lots of different situations. And just reading genealogy reference books. I've participated in Roots Tech for the past few years since it went virtual. I haven't done any type of formal training program or institute, um, but I hope to attend one someday. It just hasn't worked out with my work schedule really till now. I did think about doing the ProGen study group and I thought about joining. In the end, I just kind of decided to try it on my own and to go for it. Wow, that's so neat. I think you're kind of unique because a lot of people who don't have formal training, they don't pass according to the BCG statistics. And so they told me that as well. (laughs) Congratulations. In the email or letter, somebody from there said, we don't usually have anyone pass that didn't intend at least some sort of institute or something. Yeah. I think what I learned from attending an institute is that there's a lot of things I don't know. And it gave me like a path of what I needed to study. But I like that you were able to figure out what you needed to study through watching webinars on legacy and just reading genealogy reference books, which I think is very similar to what you did, Mom. I was just going to say that it's exactly what I did. I just read books, watched webinars. I had never done an institute either and basically just did my own education and it worked out great. I think it really depends on your personality and, you know, how you like to learn. And for me, I just like to dig in and do it on my own. But now I'd love institutes. So, you know, at the time, I just didn't know that much about them, I think. Well, let's talk about some of your challenges, because both these processes have challenges. I really didn't have strong skills in abstracting documents before I started this journey. So I did an online course, I think it was from NGS, and really started practicing. I could do pretty well reading the handwriting in old documents. So the transcription part of it wasn't that hard, but doing abstracting was kind of a new concept for me. I'm also not very patient. And so I had to wait six months to hear whether or not I passed. So that was part (laughs) of the hard part, Um, but it was worth it. Yeah, I'm sure that after a while you weren't always looking in your email inbox for an answer, but when six months came up, you were probably checking every day to see if you were ever gonna hear. You just wanna know. Well, I think that's interesting that abstracting was a challenge because that really is something we are not taught a lot to do unless we're doing client work or we're doing something like certification. You know, that's not part of the building a family tree usually when you're just attaching hints and doing some research, you know, like clicking around on things. So I can see how that was definitely something that you had to really tackle and make sure you had it down. So that's great that you were able to do the NGS course and learn about that. I also did that course and someone in my accountability group had mentioned it as an option for strengthening skills in transcriptions and abstracts. And I felt pretty confident, but I had only done a few abstracts. <laughs> like you said, Michelle, it's just not something that you do that often. And so I kind of wanted a little more practice with that. And I thought the NGS course was really in depth and gave a lot of chance for practice. So that was neat. Side question, Michelle, how long did you spend on your portfolio? So part of it were things that I had written up previously, like just for my own self that I had worked on. And so I incorporated part of a a big project that I had done into my kinship project. And so a lot of it was sort of already done. So probably about five or six months from the time that I said, oh, I think I want to do this till I submitted it. Nice. So that would be hard to wait another six months. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I already, I could have finished this again in six months. <laughs> That's great. Well, now that it's over and you were successful, what are the benefits that you feel you gained from the process? I feel like I have a much clearer picture of the types of reports that they wanted. They asked for a research report, a case study or problem solving, and then the kinship project. In reality, in the past, I've probably written reports that were a conglomeration of those three types of reports because I was only writing for myself. Um, And so now I kind of understand the purpose of each style. And I feel like that the quality of my report writing has gone up. My writing skills were probably some of my strongest skills just from my previous work and I've always just been a good writer. So that part of it was not as hard as the research skills, I think, for me. That's wonderful. I feel like the different writing styles and different writing projects is something that I've had to really study as well, having first started my training with my mom and writing reports. 
for clients. And that was kind of my first type of genealogy writing. So it has been interesting to study the differences between the case study and the kinship determination versus a client project. Right. And I think that's fun that you have differentiated how to do each one of those. So that's a great skill. Well, let's have a word from our sponsors, newspapers.com. Did your ancestor disappear from vital records? Maybe they moved or got married. Newspapers.com can help you find them and tell their stories. Or have you ever had trouble figuring out how people tie into your family tree? Newspapers are filled with birth notices, marriage announcements, and obituaries. Items like these are a great resource for determining family relationships. On newspapers.com, you can explore more than 800 million newspaper pages from across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and beyond in just seconds. Their easy-to-use search feature lets you filter your results by date, location, a specific paper, and more. When you find something interesting, the newspapers.com clipping tool makes it a snap to share it with family and friends. You can even save it directly to your ancestry tree. For listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering new subscribers 20% off a publisher extra subscription, so you can start exploring today. Just use the code FAMILYLOCKET at checkout. Well, Michelle, let's talk about your favorite work sample. One of them was uh, what they called document work. So they supplied a, a historical document and then you had to do several things with it. You had to transcribe it and abstract it, and then you had to take it and develop a, a research plan. So I thought I would not enjoy that at all, <laughs> but I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Um, it's, you know, you're taking a document for a family that I have no knowledge about, and then I'm trying to put together a research plan. So that's really new for me since I don't do client work. Um, I have a lot of respect for those of you who do, because that was, I think that was hard for me to try to wrap my brain about what, what I know and what I don't know from this one document and where to go next. So, um, but I, I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. I think creating a research plan from a document is really a fascinating exercise. And we do something like that with accreditation as well. And I remember when I first started doing a client work, I really didn't know if I'd enjoy you know, working on somebody else's family history. And it was when I was helping my neighbor that I realized this is really fun. I love the research. It doesn't have to be my own family, you know. And so I think that that was a fun revelation for me. And it sounds like you kind of discovered that too, that, you know, it's just our researcher brain. We like taking this little challenge and then figuring out what we would do to find out more. So that's really interesting that you enjoyed the document work. So the document work was new and challenging, but how did you feel about the KDP? Uh, <laughs> that kinship project was was definitely challenging. Um, first for me to find four generations where I really had adequate level of proof to tie together every generation. I mean, most of my family is from the South. And so, you know, uh, the, the records are sometimes challenging. And they're always, when I would look at four generations, I would always find one generation where I just felt like it wasn't quite as strong. Then finding some way to tie it all together, a, a background story or a thread to to make the report more than just a dry rendition of generations. So I had um, discovered that my third great grandfather murdered his neighbor in the 1850s in middle Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I am just fascinated by that story. So not only just what happened to him, um, which apparently he went to um, the state penitentiary, but then got paroled or um, reprieve or whatever, um, along with everyone else in the entire prison by the governor. So like five years later. Oh. Um, so but it was really interesting to see how the extended family reacted because the family um, of the neighbor, they were all intermarried. Uh, there was four or five families that were all intermarried and interlinked. And here one person kills somebody from the, the same group. So it was really interesting to see how they reacted to the tragedy and, and that they still stayed as a pretty good unit throughout um, a couple more generations, even with this tragedy between their members. So I tried to take that story and kind of do a, a concept of how family ties work and, and taking that down through the four generations. But that was a bit of a challenge. I love that concept that the family was affected by that over time because of how they were interconnected. And you see that so much with these Southern groups of relatives, how they just families marry into the same families and they kind of stick together for generations. Yes, that is so interesting. 
And kudos to you for taking a murder story and then turning that into a positive with the family (laughs) sticking together. (laughs) But, you know, really, that is what we do. As We kind of have that responsibility as family historians to take a look at the past, look at the mistakes that our ancestors made. We all make mistakes. They did, too. And then find a lesson that we can learn from that and share that. I think that's so neat. Well, that was the Kinship Determination Project. What about the research report? So the research report, I actually did research on, uh, I have a friend who's a beginning genealogist, and she uh, allowed me to do the research report on her family. So that, again, was new to to research a family that I knew very little about. Um, I found that it was really tricky to get all the sources labeled and attached in a readable format because that's not something I normally do. I have my sources and all of my documentation within my family tree program. So I've never had to export it out for someone else along with all the images and the citations. So um, so that was challenging, um, but I definitely have a, a newfound respect for people who do that um, for every day for their clients because it's not something I want to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, the interesting thing is once you get used to it, then it becomes just second nature and you'd get a process for that and you'd be great. (laughs) So it really is all about, you know, just learning, learning the process and doing it. But I agree. I had that same challenge with accreditation that I have so many things that I never did. I didn't do the formal research log to turn in and didn't do the documents and label them for myself. So I think that's one of the great things for getting a credential is that makes you step outside your comfort zone and do something that's hard and different and that you learn from. For sure. I love that. Well, Michelle, what are your plans going forward? Do you want to publish, teach, do client work, just keep doing your own work? For right now, I just plan to use these skills to try to do high quality research for my own family. I would like to do some volunteer work someday within BCG. I do love teaching and I do a lot of it in my work. So maybe someday I could teach genealogy skills as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, maybe you could do a webinar. You know, I think that those are really fun, those case studies where you share your research and how you solve something. Those are some of my favorite things to prepare and present. So that might be something fun you could do. Well, what advice do you have for anyone who is seeking certification with BCG? I feel like my biggest piece of advice would be to really study the rubric. Um, They tell you exactly what they're looking for, and then go and read multiple examples of those different types of reports. They give you uh, access to some portfolios to be able to read examples of people's work. Um, I feel like once that light bulb went off and I, I on and I went, oh, this is exactly what they want for each type of that report then I was doing a better job. So it was definitely more focused. And the process is humbling. So you have to be prepared for that. The portfolio is reviewed by three different reviewers and who can't see each other's responses. So each one can interpret the same work in a different way. So there were some skills that I felt I demonstrated well, but a reviewer didn't agree. Um, And it's difficult to have an asynchronous review like this. There were a few items that they mentioned as deficient where I thought I had done a good job justifying why I did it the way I did. And then I realized that that's still on me, that burden. I did not explain my findings or my limitations um, very well. So obviously they didn't find that I had met the the criteria. So they did identify several areas where I can improve. So I'm going to be addressing those in my future work and hopefully continuing to learn. I love what you said that it's humbling because when we work by ourselves in a vacuum, we think we are so good at what we do. So when we submit something for peer review and we get someone who is an expert, you know, I shouldn't say tearing it apart, but just looking at it with a critical eye and with their background and knowledge, yeah, that can be humbling. But what a great attitude that you're going to address those as areas where you could improve and continue learning. I think that's one of our big takeaways from seeking credential is that we're always learning and we're always trying to improve and get better. I look back at my four generation report that I submitted and it still holds up to be pretty good, but I have learned so much more about writing. I feel like I'm a better writer now. So so much of it is experience. Yeah, that's really true. I think a lot of experience goes a long way, but at the time when you submitted your four generation report for accreditation, you had done a lot of learning and studying. And so 
it's just great to see how both of you were able to take your skills to the next level through your own home study program and watching webinars, reading books, and then just working on it. I think that's just such a good example to anyone who's wanting to try out the process that it really just comes down to setting aside the time and going for it. And that's been my biggest struggle with my portfolio is that I I haven't been able to set aside the time and just go for it. I need to work on my work samples and I know I'll do it eventually, but you know, having four kids at home has been a busy time. So I'm excited. I have all my work samples chosen and slowly working on them, but Sometimes I feel anxious to get it done and turned in. <laughs> Maybe I need a retreat to a cabin for six for months, month. like Michelle. <laughs> she did. She did it in six months. <laughs> she was holding down a full time job. So I know, you know right? See, she's a good example to me. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, this has been so fun talking with you about your journey to certification, and I really appreciate your advice that you've shared, especially about studying the rubrics, because I think that's one of the most important things as well, that once you understand what the requirements are and how you'll be judged, that it becomes much easier to create the work sample that the judges are looking for. So that was really good advice and and something that I can always do more of. And probably a lot of you out there can do the same, whether you're doing accreditation or certification. If you're working on a credential, both have guidelines and rubrics that you can study. In accreditation, are there rubrics or what do you call them? Yeah, we call them rubrics and they're right on the website, ICAPGEN website, the guide for applying for an accreditation for that credential. At the very end of that, there are the rubrics and I printed those out And before I turned in my report, I went through every single one of those and made sure I met every rubric to the T. So it's not a secret what you need to do to succeed. You just need to understand what it's talking about and then do it. So I like that there are rubrics. I think it's so helpful. And even if you're not seeking credential, you can go look at those rubrics and see how your work is stacking up. You know, what kind of a level are you working at? with your research. It might be fun just to review and see, you know, what you maybe would need to improve on. Very good. Thank you for sharing. All right. Well, thanks, Michelle, for coming. Thank you for having me. And to all our listeners, good luck with your goals. And if you're working on a credential, we hope that this helped you to think about some ways you can improve your work and become a better researcher. All right, everyone. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com slash services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com slash newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.